Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to Nintendo Prime. Uh, we got four big stories for you today. Um, but before we get into it, uh, yeah, we do have a current giveaway going on. You can head on to the description or the pinned comment to enter. Also, I do have kind of a secret big giveaway planned for the holiday season. I know many of you out there are struggling. I just want to note right now that the only requirement that's going to exist to be able to get into our massive holiday giveaway is going to be just being subscribed to the channel. So yeah, just subscribe. And by the way, set your notification bell if you feel like it as well, because um, we have a lot of content coming your way that you're not going to want to miss. That being said, let's get into today's news. So our first story, I need to give a bit of a warning on. Uh, this story does contain foul language. Uh, it is not my words, it's theirs. We do allow, obviously, some um, more mature language, I guess we'll say, when we're doing our live streams. But for videos like this, we like to kind of keep it mostly clean. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the case with the story, and I'm not going to be bleeping anything out because I don't believe in doing that. If YouTube wants to ding me and take away my ads, it is what it is. What matters is the actual story in full context. So, David Jaff has been in the news um, because he has been insulting Metroid Dread's design, specifically the fact that walls and, um, you know, floors and ceilings that you can shoot and then destroy are not marked. They're not, no visual indicator on the actual wall or ceiling or floor that it can be destroyed um, he thinks this is really really horrible design now if you're wondering who the hell david jaff is i don't blame you um, he hasn't done anything in a while in the game industry of note uh, but he is one of the main mi minds behind twisted metal and god of war so he is an industry veteran and he basically called up mercury steam and nintendo for being really bad with game design Obviously, fans didn't take too kindly to this and explained to him the many ways he was wrong, including this. That the game tells you to shoot at walls and then presents that exact mechanic to you right away. So, it's one of those situations where did he just forget what the game told him to do and it does all the time? I don't know. But, let's just say we have his response and we're going to give it in full light. He ended up posting... His overall response, by the way, he's doubled down and tripled down on his stance this whole time. Uh, but he had a response to people who disagree with him, in particular fans of Metroid. Uh, and we need to read this to understand more of his mentality. So he put this response up at NeoGAF, and here's what he said. I don't imagine myself to be anything. That sounds like a you problem, pal. And I, for one, am getting sick and fucking tired of insecure gamers who act as if they do know as much as working professionals. I've had hit games and fail games, but you ain't had any games, at least most of you. So I'm sorry if it insults your ego, but I know shit you don't, just like you know shit I don't about your line of work. It's not a brag, it's just how experience works. It doesn't make my opinion any more or less valid than your opinion, but it does mean that when I bring shit up, I have experience to back it up. And so I mention that. Deal with it. Or don't. But stop being such insecure bitches about it. Hell, you want to make games and think you can, you know so much? Nice. It's never been easier to make your own games. Go do it or shut the fuck up about it. Related. Look. I have a channel about games and game design. I'm not looking to do anything other than express my views on my channel. Now, do my views happen to be based on decades of working in the industry as a designer and as a director slash designer on a few really big games? Sure. And so I use that knowledge, just like I'm sure many of you are using your background as someone who may have played every Metroid since the NES version. We all bring our own history to our ideas, content, work, and life in general. As for the multiple room thing, I accept that I was wrong. This is a point that 
you know, he's trying to give himself credit for and admitted I was remembering it wrong in my last video. I remembered it wrong and instead of the 20 to 30 rooms, I recall being open there were only four. And I said I was wrong, which I was. So what? I think some of you all are projecting when you say his ego won't let him lose or change his mind. I'm wrong a lot about shit on my channel and when it's pointed out to me, I take it back and as needed apologize. And in this case, I was wrong. But I still stand by the other complaints. I think it's bad design. You don't. That's great. Agree to disagree. But I gotta say, I've never encountered such a whiny ass fan base as I have with Metroid fans. And I say this as a Nintendo fan. A guy who is excited to buy Mario Party next week and review Unseen because I love the series and the characters that much. A guy who bought Metroid excited to get into it as much as I was into Link and his adventures. Sadly for me, it didn't work out. But good fucking God, the obsession with defending a game that you didn't design or work on is staggeringly concerning. Jaff. Let's just say, wow. There is so much to unpack. I'm not even sure how to react other than to say he has a massive disrespect for gamers and gamers opinions on games. I can only say the following and I can respect his opinion that he thinks the walls and the ceilings and stuff should have visual indicators on the actual walls and ceilings themselves. I get it. It's, it, it is something modern gaming has been doing for a long time. And while it's a bit handholdy, it is what it is. Some people are just going to prefer that method versus Metroids, which doesn't necessarily give you that sort of visual indicator. You can argue there's other visual indicators, but it is what it is. And it's okay that he doesn't like Metroid. That's not, that's neither here nor there. But I will say this. David Jaff said something controversial about a game. The controversial thing he said was not very well defended. Because he showed a gameplay clip showing off, um, you know, a hidden area that he, how the hell is he supposed to know about it? And as he was playing Metroid Dread, he was playing it not only poorly, which I play games poorly, but he wasn't even aiming in the 360 degrees or 180 degrees, however you want to look at it, um, way that you can in Metroid Dread. He wasn't using this laser sight and he was having a hard time shooting enemies. Fine. I get it. It happens, right? We, I'm not criticizing his inability to play the game. But if you're gonna be super critical of a mechanic in the game, at least show your competency at the mechanics you don't have an excuse for. Ultimately, to me, this just means David Jaff is not good at games that are difficult that don't tell him exactly what to do 100% of the time, which again, is fine. But people were obviously gonna be critical because you are a figurehead in the industry, whether you want to be or not, but you keep reminding people repeatedly in your response how important you are and use that to go ahead and insult gamers in an unprofessional manner? Insult Metroid fans? Yeah, I, mm, guess what? The internet's gonna have hate when you have a controversial opinion. Welcome to the internet, David Jaff. What do you think happens when you have a controversial opinion that goes against the grain. You're going to get the ire of a lot of gamers. And that sucks. And sometimes a lot of us gamers will say things that we probably shouldn't, but you're outright dismissing the very people that play the game. Bottom line is you cannot like that game design. Does it make it bad game design? Okay, that's not how game design works. It is a trial and error type of design that's intentional and taught to you early in the game. And clearly millions of people don't have a problem with it. Now it's fine that you do, and you might feel that your problem with it is bad design. Other people are gonna feel in their opinion, your problem with it is that you want your hand held. These are both valid opinions. You being a veteran game designer does not make your opinion more valid than the people actually playing the game. See, this is a fundamental problem with his entire argument. He thinks he's up here and you're down here. Oh, your opinion is just as valid, but mine's defendable. He's not really, he's saying your opinion just as valid as his, 
while saying your opinion's not as valid as his. Here's the bottom line. Games are made for gamers. This is why a gamer's opinion on game design can matter just as much as the people who actually design the games. Because who are the people that have to deal with the result of those designs? The gamers. So gamers' opinions on a game design, a element of game design in a Metroid game is as valid as yours because they're the ones that have to experience and play it. You didn't enjoy your experience with this design choice. And I'm just talking about this one game. I'm not mentioning that it's been on every Metroid. You don't agree with this design choice. Other people think it's the right move and it makes the game more difficult and adds an air of challenge. Challenge that they enjoy. And you don't, and that's okay. Why can't we just leave it at that? Why do we have to go ahead and try to make gamers sound like their opinion on game design of a game they're playing design that makes that game enjoyable or not doesn't matter that they have to go make games to get it no they don't if they enjoy the game as it is they like this feature in the game by nature that makes it good game design for them but what am i gonna do i'm not gonna hurl insults at you man I respect the work you've done in this industry. I just wish you would respect the fans that you make the games for. Their opinions matter because this is their entertainment medium, not yours. You make the games for them to enjoy. If they enjoy it, ergo, it was probably good design. It's fine to be hypercritical. Just don't insult people along the way and insult their intelligence and act like their opinions matter less than your own. None of them matter more than, my opinion doesn't matter more than yours and yours doesn't matter more than mine. Can't we just leave it at that? So another weird thing has been happening. Um, FIFA, you guys probably know FIFA. If you're a gamer, you probably know it more as a video game franchise ran by EA. Uh, if you are a you know, soccer slash football fan, you know it better as the giant organization that runs the most popular sports league in the entire world. Now there's other cups and other leagues and all that, but FIFA is the big boy, the top dog. They're like the NFL of that sport. All right. So here's the thing. We knew there was something going on between FIFA and EA for a little bit now because EA publicly announced that they are looking into rebranding FIFA moving forward. We weren't really sure why. We just assumed, oh, bad FIFA. FIFA wants double the money. That was the report. FIFA wants double the money. Bad on FIFA. Boo FIFA. Boo the money-grubbing multi-billion dollar organization, which also applies to EA. Boo on them. Well, FIFA came out and fired back. And let's just say they are very upset with EA. Here's what FIFA said. FIFA is bullish and optimistic about its long-term future in gaming and esports following a comprehensive and strategic assessment of the gaming and interactive entertainment market. It's clear that this needs to be a space that is occupied by more than one party controlling all rights. FIFA has also determined that the overlaps between virtual sport and FIFA's football competitions must be more closely aligned. In this respect, FIFA is excited about using the FIFA World Cup with 4 billion viewers and the FIFA's Women's World Cup with an audience of 1.2 billion as platforms to launch and integrate exciting new games and esports opportunities. In other words, they are tired of being exclusive to EA. Sounds like a broken record, doesn't it? Disney pulled exclusivity of Star Wars away from them. I hope the NFL does the same and pulls the exclusivity rights away from Madden. Now look, I'm not saying that I want the FIFA game to stop from EA. Continue to make your soccer game. You might have to call it something else now because FIFA doesn't want their brand to just mean one thing. They want it used across multiple games. But you know how good this is for gamers? FIFA can now use its branding and everything else about it in multiple games of multiple companies. This is going to lead to better competition in this market. 
And by the way, as Switch owners, you know how exciting this is? Because EA has treated us as second-class citizens since day one with FIFA. Keep getting legacy editions. Oh no, this is the best mobile. Screw off. You're making an excuse to not give us current versions. Well, guess what? Now it can be put in the PES. It can be put into other games that can now use the FIFA branding to help inspire their games to be even better, and they can become front runners. This hurts EA and it helps gamers. And if you enjoy EA's brand of football games, that's fine as well. But guess what? They're gonna have to make them better now because their stranglehold on the FIFA IP, the FIFA licensing is gone. So now the players, the likenesses, the leagues, the World Cup can all be present in other games. You done messed up EA to the benefit of all of us. So I guess, thank you for that. Now this next story is about this video back here and um, it's ratioed bad. Nintendo's Switch Online Expansion Pass has 16,000 likes to 74,000 dislikes. No, Nintendo's not gonna change the pricing. I know they're not gonna change it. You know they're not gonna change it. And there'll be millions of people that end up spending it anyways, as we saw with the N64 controller selling out like that. But here's the thing, I don't really think the price point is worth it. Now, maybe you're someone who's just super looking forward to playing N64 games online, and it didn't matter what they charged, it was gonna feel worth it to you. You'll see people in the comments telling you, oh, it's just $4 and X cents per month. Oh, if you have, um, you know, if you're on the family pass, it's only $10 a year. That's assuming you have eight people and you're splitting the cost, which most people with family passes do not. It's, I get it, right? In the grand scheme, $50 or $80 isn't a lot of money. I can't even fill the gas tank in my car for $80, right? So it's not a ton of money to spend once a year. No one's arguing that the total amount of money is a lot. In the grand scheme, $180 for um, Xbox Live Gold plus Game Pass, so basically Game Pass Ultimate for a year, isn't really that much money either. But it's not about whether or not it's relatively a lot of money compared to putting gas in your car, buying groceries, paying your electric bill. It's not about whether it's a lot of money in comparison to that. It's about, is it a lot of money in comparison to what everyone else in this space is doing? And yeah, you aren't giving us basic online features and you wanna start charging very close to what Xbox and PlayStation charge for a year without giving us modern games every month or a guarantee of even adding games to N64 and Genesis every month. There's no guarantee that's gonna happen. There's no guarantee that you're gonna actually do anything with this improved online infrastructure you supposedly have. There's no guarantees of anything getting better voice chat localized on the platform, adding the ability to message people. There's no guarantee you're going to add any of this. So because of that, people are upset. You're charging a lot of money relative to other companies and not giving us as much value. And that's ultimately what you're gonna get your criticism from. So it is what it is, Nintendo ain't gonna change, but I hope they take this feedback at least not just the dislikes, but the feedback in general that people are talking about why they dislike this price and take it into consideration when they make new additions to Nintendo Switch Online in the future that hopefully exist. Because we don't know if they're gonna make any new additions. All right, this last story is just kind of a quick one. So Sora came out in Super Smash Bros. Sora from Kingdom Hearts released last night in Super Smash Bros. Crashed the eShop, all that jazz, it happens, right? Every time a really popular Smash character comes out, there's a little eShop snafu for, I don't know, an hour or so. But here's the thing. Cool, Sora's out. Everyone's loving them, playing them, enjoying Smash Bros. But you know what also happened? Super Smash Bros. Ultimate hopped back up into the top three on the Nintendo Switch eShop, showing that Sora from Kingdom Hearts is selling Super Smash Bros. copies. It has been a long time, over a year, since Super Smash Bros. Ultimate has been in the top three of the Nintendo Switch eShop here in the United States. It's a rarity for that game to get back up that high on the charts, but Sora made it happen. This also makes you wonder how many people who bought Smash Bros. are going to sell the Kingdom Hearts collection coming to Switch. 
which again, I think is gonna be impacted by the fact that it's streaming only. So I'm not even sure it's a fair thing, but we'll see. Maybe Smash Bros will force people, or not really force, but encourage people to actually massively buy Kingdom Hearts on Switch, even if it's only streaming. Time will tell, but clearly Sora was obviously the right choice financially for everyone involved. Square needs to be ecstatic about the attention that Sora is getting. And Nintendo's got to be ecstatic that this final character is selling so many extra copies, maybe millions. Also, by the way, Metro Dread's still at number one. That's pretty badass. All right, folks, that's going to do it for today's video. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll catch you in the next one.